Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Boom, and welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Boss Shot Shells. I am Jeff Stanfield with the world famous fucking Andy Shaver. And I'm with us today. That's me. NASCAR driver, NASCAR spotter from Kernsville, North Carolina, Mr. Rick Corelli. Rick, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you guys doing today? Doing excellent. How's the, uh, is North Carolina the prettiest place on earth? It's very nice. It's, this time of year, it's kind of a little humid, gets a little ugly, but uh, I'm from Colorado originally, so I'm kind of biased to there. I, I think the Rocky Mountains are probably one of the best things they can look at when you look out our old back window. We used to live right by Coors uh, in Denver and look out at the uh, Tabletop Mountain. I, I like that, but Kernersville has a very nice, uh, interesting scenery, a lot of trees. Speaking of scenery, you used to work for Kevin Harvick, correct? Yeah, that's what brought me down here, actually. I've known Kevin pretty much all, all his life. I raced in Bakersfield for many years. His father was my crew chief. And then uh, once my career got done driving, I moved down here with Kevin wanted me to be his GM. So we moved down here in 2005. And we had a good run at it until like 2011 when we shut down the shop. So. Is his wife as hot as she looks like she is on TV? <laughs> yeah, she, Elaine is a good person. Yeah, she's a... She's a good-looking lady. Yes, she is. I saw Tony Sturt slap her on her ass one time at a race, and I thought she's going to beat the hell out of him. Well, you know, Stewart, he don't care. He's not politically correct. He just goes wherever he goes, and then he turns that little grin up, you know, and makes it <laughs> smile like everything's fine. <laughs> and moves on. So, uh, you you raced with all those guys, and you're, you're around them. I'm going to get a few questions of you about the few drivers. Is Richard Petty as down-to-earth as he seems like he is? The king is probably one of the most down-to-earth persons you've ever want to meet, you know. And if you look at him at his age right now and how invested he is with the race team and uh, his accomplishments through the years and what he's done, him and uh, Dale Inman, you probably won't find a bunch more humble people but more competitive and more in, engaged as, as they are right now. Okay. To be honest with you. Does Dale Jr. seem like he's as nice a guy as he is? Yeah, Junior's pretty, uh, I mean, I see him on the spotter stand. I mean, like when we come down the TV stuff, he's uh, he's pretty open. I mean, he's pretty laid back. He's got his, uh, you know, old school T-shirts on, and he just, you know, he's happy-go-lucky. I think he's a lot more uh, in touch with people now that he's in uh, the, the, the light other than racing. You know, when he's racing, you know, everybody's got to have that little stigma about him that, you know, you don't want to be touched or bothered, you know, but he's pretty personal. Is Coach Gibbs as anal as he seems like he must be? Now, Coach Gibbs is pretty, you know, that's a, that's a different gentleman, you know. he uh, When you look at what he's done and what he's accomplished, and, you know, he uh, he keeps a big fist. I don't think he's anal. I think he, he knows what he wants, and he wants respect for what he does. And, you know, the run of the Washington Redskins that he did and, you know, different personalities that they had through that football uh, leagues and, uh, and the racing, which you have right now, I think he's a great fit for what he does in this uh in his company and uh you know coil coy's running it there with him and uh you know hey when you, you can't argue success they got great drivers they got great backing and uh they have great race cars i'm a i grew up a redskin fan and i was a big joe gibbs fan and it's amazing to think that a man can be a super bowl winning coach multiple super bowl winning coach leave football come back and win again and then go to nascar and win like he has in nascar that's just that those those two things don't go together and that's what's crazy to be as successful as he's been? Well, I think the biggest thing is what you, you got to put together is, is look at you build a team by your personalities and what you got. You have great sponsors and great backing, and, you know, you go out there and you put it out there and you go, hey, we're going to do this, but what's it going to take? So I'm sure he uh, he's a very well organizer, very well putting people together, and he reads people very well, and he puts people in his place how they need to be. So uh, – to take from what he did in football and just put it on is it's all about managing people and running them and let people do what they need to do. Because when, you know, you try to micromanage somebody they're they're not really going to do what they need to do. So you kind of let them run a little wild. And, uh, before you know it, everybody's pulling the rope, same direction. Right. So what's it, what's, how do you manage, uh, your ego as a driver? You know, cause I, I gotta imagine that's, that's probably the tougher aspect uh, of racing is just you know like you said you got to kind of walk with a little bit of a swagger and a little chip on your shoulder if you're going to perform on race day so how do you manage that 
I think the biggest thing is, is you got to realize when you walk in the arena, I mean, the only people you got to supporting you is the people that you bring with you, you know? So when you, uh, you're racing all those competitors, when you're racing them, the biggest thing I used to always say, I want to inflict pain on grown men. So, uh, you know, then at night, when you, at midnight, when it come back, you know, it reset and then you got to start all over. So you got to have some swagger about you. You know, you can be a personal person on the outside, but you got to realize when you get inside that race car that uh, it's you against them. And that's the biggest thing. You got to survive because everybody's trying to take something away from you that you want and you're all trying to achieve the same deal. So, I mean, when I raced for many years, I mean, I had a few personal friends that I did, but I mean, it didn't matter on the racetrack. I mean, you may give them one, one coupon, I would say. The second coupon, you take it away. <laughs> You know, and the perfect thing is afterwards, like, why'd you do that to me? I don't say the same thing you'd have done to me. So it's really no big deal. But, you know, you know, rivalries, you know, years ago, me and Hornaday were, were very competitive with each other. And I got an opportunity to work with him when uh, at KHI. And, uh, you know, he, he puts it in. It's like his simple thing is when he goes in, I used to always say there's a switch on his forehead. He'd flip in and that switch would flip on. And when he'd get out, that flip would switch off and it would be come back to it. So. I think that's you got to manage it yourself. You got to have ego. You got to have pride. You got to have knowing what you're doing, and you got to you got to deliver. And you know, and the people that deliver can carry the stick however they want to carry it. Is uh, who's the best? Who's the greatest driver that you've ever raced against? That really, you just thought was the most talented driver. Talent. You know, there's there's a lot of guys that I've I've run against. You know, there's a lot of guys that I've watched. You know, and. Uh, you know, I think a well-rounded one. I mean, I mean, I think Stewart's very well-rounded. And I think Carl Larson right now is light years ahead of a lot of people right now because he can get in anything. You know, like Stewart could get in anything and he could win with it and he could deliver. And if you look at Kyle right now, he's getting in, you know, midget sprint cars, whatever, and winning and and dominating this year. There's many races he's could have. Uh, he could have easily had ten wins this year, you know, but uh, certain things didn't work out the right way. But you know, in my air, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of us who are well-rounded. I think, you know, when you look at the truck series, it, when it started, you know, I have I got to be a, a part of that. And everybody that was in that series was a, a champions from somewhere. We all grew up, you know, scratching, grinding, not having nothing and, and learned how to race. So we all raced each other respectfully, but we all raced each other very hard. Is that hard to do? Is it hard to separate uh, your personal life, you know, your personal friendships that you might have with other drivers on the racetrack? You know, you said you give them, you know, one free coupon. Um, is, it, is it ever kind of, do the lines ever get blurry for you? Or are you, were you always able to uh, separate your personal and your professional life? Well, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, I would always look at it it's no different what somebody would do right. to me, you know, if doing or I mean, I would just, I mean, I would look at it. There's one, you know, you say, all right, well, maybe he didn't see me or, you know, whatever. But when you, you know, you can tell when it's blatant, you can tell when it, it's moved around. So, I mean, obviously you just got to do what you got to do. But, you know, the biggest thing is now is all these guys, you know, you know, years ago, we all left with each other and drove to the track and came back with each other. And, you know, now you got a bunch of people that, you know, are in an infield and they got a bunch of motorhomes and, all their kids play together and uh, everything's sitting in there together and, uh, you know, they all become friends, you know, so you got to separate that. But, you know, I think Stewart separated well. I think Kevin Harvick separates it well. I think Kyle Busch separates it well. Kurt is another one that's very strong. There's, there's so many guys that are older school guys, I think, that, that can separate the two, you know, but that's just my opinion in it, you know. I think before when we raced, you know, we didn't we didn't have a lot. So we were hungry all the well, time. Well, Kyle Busch is hard to. Not, not saying they're no. not. You know, I'm just. Kyle, Kyle Busch is hard to root for. Oh, why? He, the guy's he's one, all, that's, well, he's one, that's why he's hard to vote for, to, to root for. Why would you not I root just, for him? I mean, he. I get it. But, I mean, when you look at. You, go put put it in perspective what he's done in his short Oh, he's career. an awesome driver. No doubt. I mean, put it in it, you know, and, and the problem is he don't care. That's why. Another reason. <laughs> and he's going to tell you what he thinks, and it doesn't matter. If everybody had the passion that he has, it'd be a pretty tough sport, which I'm not saying they don't, but there are certain people that are just light years ahead. I mean, it's like the other night in Richmond. 
he was faster. He took, you know, he took his lumps. He came back, you know, following week in Darlington. He said he didn't run good. He had an issue. He came there and he dominated. He was dominating Richmond. You know, he had a he had an issue on pit road. But I mean, that's how those guys play. They push the envelope every time, whether you're coming down pit road or whether you're on the racetrack or whether you're driving away from the racetrack. You know, that's that's. I mean, I, I love his passion. So I mean, he, he's going to be. He, Kyle Busch is going to be like Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods, when he come on, everybody cheered for him. Then he started winning all the time. Well, somebody wanted to see somebody else win or do good. And then all of a sudden, he comes back. As he gets older, you should appreciate it more. And that's why Kyle Busch is. Ten years from now, I'll probably be rooting for Kyle Busch. But Ky- the thing is, is you, don't, you just don't realize how good people are until you watch. It's just like different when, when Larson came up years ago. I watched him when I was at Kevin Harvick's, and we run it. And I watched him drive the trucks when he drove for Turner and stuff like that. And that guy could just make things happen that nobody could make things happen. You know, a lot of people say, well, maybe he's too small, too, too little or whatever. He's proved everybody totally wrong. He's, you know, he's with a great organization right now. You know, he had a hiccup, you know, where he got away from the sport he loved and come back to it. And he came back hungrier than uh, most. You know, and, and he's proven it, and he's got a great organization. Behind. I watch – I'm a World Outlaws guy, and I watch the, the run sprints every weekend. I have dirt vision, and I watch it at midnight some nights or on Monday, but I watch both races – or how many races they have, I haven't missed one all year. And I wish he was running full-time because I am not a fan of his brother-in-law's, Brad Sweet. But he is <laughs> – Larson is damn good, and it's, it's funny because he won the midget the Chili Bowl in Tulsa. He goes and he wins the mm-hmm. – the the king I forgot I got the name of it at Eldora that they king, the king the king's whatever, Royal, and, then goes, and then he goes to the late models yeah. and wins that shit so you know all them dirt track guys hate his ass when he shows up they're like oh shit motherfucker go back well the problem is that they need to cherish it because when he shows up it just shows you where your game's at that's exactly if you right. want to be that good you got to be that good and uh, you know I always looked at it I welcome somebody to come race against me because. Then you can always judge yourself. If you're racing against the same people every week and you're winning every week, okay. But as you up the caliber of competition, you realize, hey, I may I may not be that good. But then when you go out of town and you do something and you run with everybody there and you're there, you make it. But local, I mean, it's the same thing. You know how to walk. You know how to walk out. You know how every nook and cranny on the racetrack and everything you do. So you need to go to some place that's ne- you've never been. To judge your talents, and that's when you look at what he's done, you know. And everybody in, in the cup level, when you look at him, you know, you may look at the bottom side of it or the top side of it. Everybody's been a champion somewhere, and everybody deserves to be there. But just sometimes the cream rises to the top, you know. So it's. I'm going to ask you two controversial questions after what you just said, and, and so. <laughs> okay. Danica Patrick, did she deserve to be in NASCAR? I think it was, uh, she was there for a reason to try and make it work, you know, and I think it was a way to jump the sport to try and get women in it and and involved. But I mean, when you look at what she's done, she done well on speedway racing. She done good in her open wheel cars and she won races, you know, she did, but you know, maybe she came in with, uh, you know, a lot of expectations that she had and maybe she was carrying that stick bigger and, and there's a lot of guys that, that went there that did not give her an ounce of credit or an ounce of slack and used her up pretty much every chance they get. So, you know, she came in with uh, maybe getting placed in, in, in the position to race, but she also didn't get a fair shake from everybody involved because they thought it was an unfair. Do you think if they, That's they thought I, that she was there just because she was a woman? And she took the spot yeah, of a man. You know, I mean, she got great sponsors, and she was with Stuart Haas, and they sat on, you know, I mean, you know, Daytona, they go sit on the pole at Daytona. You know, a lot of people sit on the pole at Daytona. You know, you have fast race cars, and those guys build fast race cars. You know, but, I mean, you go from driving Indy cars with all kinds of downforce to go driving a stock car that doesn't have the same kind of downforce. And everything doesn't feel, because no matter what you look at it, your butt goes off, you go off your butt. That's your sensor. And, it, and if it doesn't feel the same, that pedal don't go down like it would go down. So it, it's it's a transition that, you know, later on as she went on, she did, she got better sometimes when she ran her, you know, bush cars and, you know, some kinds in, in her cup cars, she got used up a lot. But there was a lot of, you know, I think, obstacles in the way that she had to deal well, with. Well, she's, 
That's she, easy. She's got bigger balls than I have because I couldn't go that fast in the car. So I'll give her yeah. that. But I just wonder if she was one yeah. of the best 43 drivers out there. Well, I mean, she got placed there by a sanctioning body that thought they needed to open the sport up to get different different ways to look at the sport, you know, to advertise, to bring more people in and get more people rooting for it. I mean, when you looked at it, the grandstands, there wasn't a woman or a little kid that didn't have a Danica shirt on, and there wasn't somebody that didn't cheer. So I believe she deserved to be there. I mean, I do. Well, that's a very fair answer. Now, let me ask you this. It, you know, we mentioned the, the big boys going to, like, these dirt tracks and stuff, and you see where you at, you see where you're at and your driving skills are. Are there – what uh -huh. do guys – so say, you know, the big dog comes in and he just beats the shit out of you. Can these smaller guys, can they work up to his level – or or is or is or does he have an instinct that a lot of these guys will never have? Well, I mean, you don't you don't get to the level of like a Kyle Larson or a Tony Stewart or AJ Foyt years ago if you didn't have the tenacity and the drive to do better. Some people get complacent and think they're this is all they're they're going to do and accomplish. You know, you got to set your goals as high as you're going to be. If you're going to be one, you know. If you're going to go after one, be a grizzly. You know, you don't want to be a cat, you know. So it all depends from within. You know, it, you got to know no limits. You got to not be afraid. And you got to not think. So, I mean, when you look at somebody that just goes out there and drives a race car, they're not thinking about what they're doing or how they're doing it. They're just driving that car to the best ability that they can drive it. And you see certain people shine in different ways and other people can't shine in different ways. So it's. I, it, it, you know, that's what separates. That's why there's X number of people that play NBA and X number of people that play in the NFL. Right. You know, we all we all think we can until uh, you strap it on and you go try and do it, and you're like, wow, this is a whole different thought but process. But this is what fascinates me with sports like racing, golf, this fascinates me because <clears throat> there's so many people, and I don't know what the it factor is, and I, and I can't really get anybody to give me a good explanation of what it is that separates somebody – that's good on a dirt track, might win, but then a guy like Kyle Larson comes and then just annihilates him. Or Tiger Woods, you know, he comes in and he just beats the shit out of somebody. With, a, at, with, with like baseball, basketball, things. or football, I can kind of see where like Tom Brady's good. Like he, he studies film. He takes care of his body. Um, sure. But I, I just – I don't know what the it factor is with guys like you. Well, I think it's no different when you look at something, when you got a niche for something. If you look at something, whether you're shooting a gun or you're shooting or you're hitting, throwing a football or whatever, certain people see things in a different manner than somebody else does. So, like, you know, we can go out. I can go shoot. I love to shoot sporting clay. Well, I, can't, I can buy the best gun I can buy. doesn't mean it's going to let me shoot 100 sporting clay. I still have to do it. You can go buy the best race cars you can be can buy are the best crew chief it doesn't mean you're going to still go win you got to have the right equipment and then you got to have somebody that has the right feel to make it happen like when kyle gets out there and all the good ones you never thought about it you just went out and drove the race car you didn't methodically think about it you went out there and did what that ability of that car could do now, like tiger wood the way he sees the green the way he hits it the way he stays his formation He's just better than a lot of other people in critique when he was younger. So I think when you grow up, you are stuck in a mold however you want to achieve. We all dabble in a lot of things, but some people say, hey, I want to be the best I can be. So it all depends who's going to drive you to be the best you can be and the ability from inside to be the best you can be. When I started racing years ago at Lakeside Speedway, I watched certain people that, that I idolized. And I always said, well, hey, when I race there, I want to be, I want to beat them. I want to be the best I can be at doing what I need to do. And I worked at it. And it's like certain people, like, you know, they come out, well, you know, Carell, you, you do this and you do that. And it's no, I worked a regular job. I stayed up and worked on my race car at night. And I did whatever. And I used to always ask him, like, what'd you do with your race car this week? He goes, well, I took it off the trailer Saturday and I washed it. Well, I worked on mine on Monday. I checked to make sure the motor thing. I had a process of what I did because it was, I was going to break before the race car broke. I mean, I was never, ever going to quit. That was my mentality, which probably hurt me in ways when I about killed myself a couple of times. But I never, ever 
gave up that part of it. If I was going to wreck, I never believed I was going to wreck until I actually hit her. They came got me. <laughs> it, it, you, know, you, just, you just don't give up, you know, and and that's the difference with some of these guys. You, you, they just love it, need it, and I mean, Kevin. Harvey, I mean, you'll, you'll never see anybody, as far as I'm concerned, at the back side of a race if you need somebody to go find some more speed. He's done it repeatedly all the time because that's just the way he's built. Right. You know, he wants it. See, and I, I truly believe and, that there are guys that it does not matter how much they practice, they, they, they'll never have – what it takes to be a professional and any, you know, it can be anything golf. It can be hunting golf, driving a race car. It does not matter how many hours they put in at this given event, whatever it is, they'll never make it to the top. Well, you got to have a lot of help to get to the top. The biggest thing is you got to have people that believe in you to get you there. You can be the best there is, but if you don't have somebody backing you and you don't have the money and somebody not taking you there, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get there. Then you get your frustration level where it kicks in and say, I'm a little upset. I don't want to do this or whatever. You never can get kicked down. You just have to always go at it. And that's, I mean, that was my motto. I mean, like when I got hurt years ago, I believed when I was still in the hospital that I was going to race the following week till I realized two days later, I mean, I couldn't see right. You couldn't do nothing right. But my thought process was always what I was going to do to get back in a race car. Can we, can we talk about the wreck? You can talk about anything. You had a you horrible, horrible wreck. Can, 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 Correct. How fast were you going when you hit the wall? It doesn't. I mean, I don't know. Probably 100 and some miles an hour. But it doesn't matter about the speed. It's all about the angle and everything that you hit it at. You know, so it's one of those deals. I mean, the following week we won Bakersfield. And the following week we're going to Memphis. And, you know, I said, I'm not going to give up. I knew I had it. Left front tire was rubbing, and I was told to pit multiple times. I didn't. Next thing you know, the left front tire blew, and I went in the fence and, you know, pretty much uh, broke my skull, knocked my eyes crooked, bled out, had a dissected crowd of artery in a CSF leak. So, you know, you get your rights read to you multiple times when you're in the hospital, and next thing you know, uh, I just said if it's, that's what it was going to be, that's what it was going to be, but I never gave up. And the biggest thing with me – my hard head, I just figured I, I couldn't die if I didn't go to sleep. So I never went to sleep. Oh that, was, that, was my, that was my game that I played with myself. I just didn't close my eyes. Jeez. So how long did you stay awake for? It had been two or three oh days. Oh, my goodness. I just never, I just never believed I was going to die. So I said, if I don't close my eyes, I'm still in right. control. That was my – and that's, you know, like when certain people talk about racing or they do racing – you know, you get multiple burns or you did whatever. You just don't think about it. Your mind can only think of one thing at a time. So the biggest thing is, is focus on the, the good point of what you want to do. You know, I knew my eyes were crooked. I diagnosed myself, everything. And I'm kind of like a control freak in that part of it. But when I went to Memphis, I just said a little prayer. said, oh, Lord, whatever it is, don't let me lose my kids. And I knew from then, once I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die. So not going to happen. Right. And they, they read you your, your rights several times when you're in the hospital. Oh, they read my rights. Yeah, they actually go, I think I, I heard them talking. It's like they had me, they had my ankle banded basically instead of my wrist. And I told them to take that off in a, in a nice frame of words, you know, and then uh, they come in and say, well, you know, we just scanned him and he, X number of years, he was like 40 some years old. And they go, his organs are great. You know, is he a donor? It's like, I heard what you guys Son are saying. Bitch. I'm not no. Jesus. <laughs> so I've never, you know, I'm not, I've never smoked in my life. So, I mean, it's just, it just wasn't my turn. That's that. I, I, I thoroughly believe we have a ticket in this world and a ticket out. So when it's punched, it's punched, you know, and if we knew when it was punched, we'd live our lives really stupid. So <laughs> I, I just That's don't. True. Look at it. I just look at it like. That. So you, uh, you wrecked and then you come back and raced again the next season. Didn't you after that? Well, actually, I got a, uh, yeah, I got, wreck was on May 8th, 1999. I got my eyesight back the 1st of September. I got back in a race truck in Phoenix in November. Mm. And then I came back and drove a Southwest Tour car, which I was a champion of. And I ran the Copper Classic in Phoenix and uh, I won the race. I led every lap and uh, that was that. And then I hooked up with Dale Phelan and I raced for him. 
we had some motor failures, but then at the end of the year, we ended up uh, winning Richmond. So uh, it was uh, it, it was nice. And then after that, he said he had to circle the wagons, and he went for another six months the next year. And then my sponsor was Remax with Dave Lineker, and uh, I went to work for him, and I worked down there and drove some cars with him for a while. And then after that, went through. Uh, that's when I got involved with Kevin. Now you said it it knocked your vision crooked, or cross-eyed. Well, I just vis vision your eyes towed in. Right. My my right eye was looking at my nose. My left eye was looking at my nose. So it, it was pretty weird because I had a gentleman that worked for me in uh, Colorado that that ended up passing away, but he had a a brain tumor. So I actually uh, I knew one of the neurosurgeons. So he followed me and vice versa. But when I got hurt. He called my wife and he says, the biggest thing is don't let him put a patch on his eye because it'll go dormant. So I had damage to number six and number seven nerve. And basically what it does is, you know, you, you're just looking crooked and you're cross-eyed. And basically you don't realize everybody sees yes, cross-eyed or right. double when you look down, but, but you don't realize it because you're not thinking there. Right. You know, so when my eyes were stuck, then I got involved. Once I got through all my other preliminaries and got back home and, you know, Everybody knew I was going to live and went through a bunch of checked up through my carotid and, uh, you know, go through your groin and run it up and do all this stuff and check it out. Then I uh, got involved with an eye doctor and I wore my, I, I called them Magoo glasses because they're real <laughs> thick and I had to paint a picture and the picture I had to paint was just, you know, to put everything in perspective. So I would just sit there and they said, do it, you know, couple minutes, a couple times, but I would do it first day. I did it 10 minutes, you know, then I do 10 minutes and I get tired. Then I do 15 and I just always push myself. Then later on they had to, uh, you know, a lot of people have eye coordination where they put beads, like six foot beads. You have a green bead, a red bead, a yellow bead, and you put them on your nose and you cross your eyes and you look at them, which, you know, a lot of people do that for shooting sporting clays or whatever, just for eye hand coordination. So that was another thing I did. So, it was something that I, I, I pushed myself, you know, very hard to do it. And, uh, you know, once I'd walk, you know, when I first got home, I couldn't walk heck, out the steps into the driveway, you know. So and the next day I would walk a little farther and then my kids would be with me. And then I got a pass to go to the park, you know, and we'd walk a little the path. And but anyway, it was it, it was a venture that I went through that I, you know, could tell the story, which it doesn't bother me. I'm very fortunate to go through it. So now, if it was just a process of racing, how I always raced, I had methodical ways of thinking at things. So I would never ever get down. I would get pissed. Don't get me wrong. You know, I had vertigo a couple times, which is not a good thing to do, but is what it is. Now, it, had you hit it at just any other angle? It, it probably wouldn't have been as bad. I mean, I've hit things. I've hit things harder in my life than when I got injured at uh, Memphis. But it's the angle that you go to it and way it hits. And you know, I was a good. I was a good size. I stayed in shape and I did the stuff. But it just it wasn't my turn. There's a lot of people. You know, we lost Dale Earnhardt to it, Tony Roper to it, Adam Petty, Kenny Irwin. All these guys lost it with the basal skull fracture and basically once you learn about it you can get a skull fracture falling down the steps you know just snapping your neck and a lot of people have them when they get rear-ended at 20 miles an hour you know it's just it's just a process of what happened now but, is there technology in cars it, today that that make that injury uh harder to sustain the hans device the harness yeah the hans device that you wear right now the biggest thing is it's not so much your neck stretch it's a snap on the backside. That's the crack a whip. And that's the biggest thing is, is this when it snaps, it's where you get in trouble. The Hans device now with the encapsulation of the seats, how it slows everything down, the Hans hooks there, it lets your head go forward and it stops it, brings you back. So everything that took place when people got injured and got, you know, perished from the deal, technology's come a long way. You have soft walls now, you have, you know, different, things in the car for crushing foams and stuff like that. So we learned from, you know, everybody's misfortune. And you said you knew your, your left front tire was rubbing a little bit. Well, I run into a back of a guy right at the start. I mean, we qualified, you know, if you want to be superstitious, I qualified. 
I don't know, but I think I was in pit stall 13. I think it was on lap six or something. I ran in the back of, I think it was Lance Norrick. I hit him with a left front, you know, and I said, well, heck, we're going to go a while. We're going to pit, and it'll be all fine. And everybody kept telling me to pit, pit, pit. And then I remember going down the back straightaway, which it never knocked me out. Memphis has a a, a pass that goes over the top, a walkway. And it's, it swales. It's got bumped. I remember hitting the bumps, and then all of a sudden the left front blew. But I remember, bam, I hit, and I go, damn, it's a little too early to be sweating. <laughs> well, and then right away, I... You know, once they got me out and I checked myself, I knew I wasn't sweating. So they're trying to tell me, uh, oh, no, you're all right. And then I just kind of lost my mind on him. And my wife finally told him he's a control, control freak. Just tell him what the hell he wants to hear because he's already diagnosed. <laughs> it. You know, so they told me, they told me, uh, no, you're not. And so I stuck my fingers in my ear and I says, I'm effing bleeding. So quit lying yeah. to me. You know, so that that's the way it was. But. It's just what it was, and I stayed awake when I went in the dock. You know, they flew me out of Memphis, and I went to Elvis Presley Trauma Center, and I think I was there for like maybe 14 days or so, 15. But I was just in a little little ICU room, and I'll never forget, you know, they had to, uh, your stomach doesn't like blood, so unfortunately, it, you know, after a while, you, you throw it up. And then I remember they had to tube me, and I remember when they tubed me, I... Uh, I just remember looking at the girl, and my wife was in there with me. And I said, "Man, you are a good-looking woman." <laughs> she just looked. She looked at my wife. She goes, "You don't have to worry. This guy ain't going nowhere." <laughs> uh, have you always been this uh, this con- controlling, this control freak? Like, did you do, can you re- remember as like a kid having this about you, or is this something that developed uh, it, during your racing career? I don't know. I was always wanting to do better, you know, so I always figured I always could control what I needed to control. I didn't rely on other people to control it for me. I figured, you know, if I, you know, if I'm going to play on the edge and get burnt, I'm going to get burnt. But I mean, that's just the way I did it. And I, I'd always find my limitations, but I always pushed myself farther than I would. I probably needed to be pushed, but you know, I, I grew up, you know, like everybody else, you know, we raced bikes, we did whatever we needed to do. And, had a lot of downtime to yourself and just figured it out. Now, why didn't you pit? They're telling you to pit. Why Why aren't you doing it? Because I, did, I didn't want to throw the race away and not be able to finish where I thought I needed to finish. We, we practiced really well. You just win the week before. Usually when you pit early in a race, you don't make up your laps. Mm-hmm. So I was hard-headed, to be honest with you. And, and, and if I had to do it again, I probably still wouldn't have pitted. I mean, it's just right. the way it is. Everybody asked me that, and I said, no, nah, I probably wouldn't have so, been I should, you know, from hindsight, you should. But obviously, I just thought I was bigger than the freaking tire going down. <laughs> so, so now you're... <laughs> but it, but it, it smacked my ass and told me I was wrong. <laughs> so now you're a spotter. Do you tell that... When, when you're a spotter, the big tracks like Daytona and stuff are so completely different than the uh, road course ones. How how much does the driver listen to you when you tell him to go right or go or take go right or go left or someone's passing you, or do they block out a lot of what you're saying? Uh, I, well, I mean, I hope not. I mean, we're up there talking for three hours, so I think you know we are doing something that they want us to do. We're telling where runs are coming. We're telling who's people moving at the top. You know, obviously you can feel it. You can feel that air when it gets pushed around when certain people get a big run or not run, and then. If you got a certain five cars in line, if you got a quick hold to get up so you don't get shuffled to the bottom as you watch the races, if sometimes if you don't get up quick enough as, as everybody starts dancing up, you're stuck on the bottom and you may be running fifth or something, double file. The next thing, if you don't scoot up, you're running 35th because the train goes by. So you have to take that while you can and get up there. So I think, you know, like when we do road courses, Certain road courses, we got a minimum of three to four people that help us. And we all have certain, you know, say I'm taking this section, you take this section. I'll be the main guy on the radio listening to NASCAR. We'll communicate on channel two to each other if there's an issue. And, you know, but, you know, speedway racing, it's a constant conversation. You're doing a lot of it through binoculars, you know, so you're, uh, you got to stay engaged. You, you can't get behind because, Cars are running 200 miles an hour. You're going to be behind. So you actually, you, you, like when you're at Daytona, you're on the you're you're chatting with the driver. The whole, so there's a whole lot of talking going on. Or is there more listening on his end and more talking on your end? 
Well, he usually doesn't talk. You know, you're pretty much telling him what to do. But nine times out of ten, you know, drop. I always looked at it. You're looking out the front window. You're going to see more than I can see. I'm just telling you what's behind and where the runs are coming. I can try and get get you to the bottom or not get you to the bottom. But, you know, really, let's be realistic. When you get all these multi-car wrecks, I mean, you're kind of just throwing your nuts over your shoulders and see if you're going to make through it or not. Right. But you have to anticipate it. And the biggest thing I try and do is anticipate if somebody's getting a little crazy up front or vice versa, let you know, you know, say they're getting aggressive, you know, things could happen. So fi- so as a driver, when I did that, somebody did that, you look for an out or you look someplace to be, you know, obviously if, if you're running the top, you're kind of stuck on the top, you know, the track kind of clears itself because it's going to go to the top then to the middle, you know, so it's, it's high banked and, you know, you're not really going to stop the car when you're running 200 miles an hour, you're going to point the car and try and get it where you need to go. And minimize your uh, damage. What about a, a track like Austin this year? Because it poured down rain in y'all's race, correct? Yes, sir. What What did y'all do there? I mean, do you could you even see the track? No, it was kind of a joke, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's. But we haven't raced in the rain. You know, certain things. You got certain. You got to realize we got full fender cars. We got different tires that do it, and the way they make a groove and cut a groove, and the way the water comes across the racetrack. You know, you had. You had a lot of people that were upset with that because you put a lot of people in harm's way, which you've seen a lot of the wrecks that took place. So the biggest thing is it's no different than you driving down the road or me driving down the road at a high rainstorm and you get behind somebody or get behind a tractor trailer. You can't see, you know, so if I can't see through binoculars because they're all getting wet. I mean, you're just picking little zones and you're trying to go where they're not. You know, that's the biggest thing. Like. Your, your pervert, preferred group is the opposite of what you did earlier. So, you know, you're trying to go where there's less water. You know, obviously you get shuffled to it. And certain people, you know, hesitate. And next thing you know, you smack them. So it's it was tough. I mean, it was uh, very challenging as a spotter. I'm sure very, very challenging as a driver. You know, you, you see a lot of guys that come up that front straight away that just put their left side right on the on the damn wall right there and, shuffle up by everybody and use them as they got up there because he, he didn't know what to do. And obviously, you know, but you see Austin Sindrick, he run seven, eight laps with slick tires on and driving away from everybody. So, you know, that's that fine line of certain people's butt feel different than everybody else's butt. But, but he was leading at the time and he didn't have no backsplash and no window issue or no, that was taking place for him. So, I was pulling it's for him. Tough. I was pulling for him in that race. Yeah, he's very good. I mean, he's very good at what he does. So, I mean, you know, that. but that's his background. So, you see the guys, you know, years ago, people would come in and say, we got a road racer. But, you know, when you look at it, everybody's really a good road racer now. Everybody's good. The equipment's good. The drivers have gotten better. You know, I think across the board, they look at every race as, as a, a benefit, you know, so they don't. They don't slack any of them. Yep. You know? There's not a lot of Boris Seds coming in no more like there used to be. Uh, when you looked at the Ron Fellows years ago, the Boris Seds and all the people that came in, you know, you thought they had an advantage, but guys are too good right now with the simulation, the way the cars are, the way everybody approaches the races. So it, it's a different deal. What was their justification for keeping the race on in the rainstorm? Like, what would it have taken for them to cancel it? Well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, obviously you don't want to cancel it because then you think you're, you know, a failure. But obviously once they had those, I don't think they ever anticipated that much water and that much runoff was going to be across the racetrack. I don't know their reasons. <clears throat> they have people around the racetrack to say, hey, you know, how's it look there? How's it look there? You know, certain people, they have spotters, you know, that tell them what to do. And you have drivers that are complaining and yelling and then us on the spotter stand telling, you know, the officials there, we can't see but once they got to the problem where they had that big downpour and a lot of people got tore up really bad, I think they just consumed the race, you know, because of the weather, you know. And I, I, I thoroughly believe they never thought they were going to have that much weather yep. and it was going to be that bad because the racetrack had no runoff. You know, if you're going to have that kind of race, and just my opinion, you got to have a place for the water to go. Mm-hmm. You, you can't just hydroplane across it because that's – Makes no sense. Were there a, any teams? Were there any teams that were like before the race? Like this is stupid. We're not doing this. No. Well, no. They all. You're all going to do it. You may think it's stupid. <laughs> you may voice your opinion. 
<laughs> you know, which it is kind of stupid. But I mean, a lot of people look at these guys out there racing, man. There's a bunch of dumbasses <laughs> going racing. <laughs> no, but a lot of people like different things and challenging. So I don't think anybody anticipated as bad as it got the rain was going to be that bad right you know and i think that's the problem it it had no place to go you know obviously f1 run there but it's a whole different configuration whole different downforce whole different tire whole different car you know a whole different deal so what let me ask you this now I, i'm a uh, very minor league nascar guy i watch nascar on Sundays when football season's not here. I don't watch it all the time, but I keep up with it. I've got certain drivers that I, I'm, I'm a big Kyle Larson fan now. I used to be a big Jeff Gordon fan. That was my guy that I liked because everybody liked Dale, everybody liked Dale Jr. and they all hated Jeff Gordon, so I was a Jeff Gordon yeah. guy. You went the opposite. Yeah, then, just right? to piss everybody off. And he was, and, and, he was a, does. and he was a damn good one to cheer for because he was a hell of a driver. But yes, he, I've noted – He's the one that, He's the one that put Larson at Hendrick. That's right. Since yeah. since my day, so I've been following NASCAR for probably twenty years. They've had they have more more road races this year than they've ever had before. Is that going to continue next year? I think they look at the demographics of what they got and they're trying to spice up. Obviously, I know everybody. It's an entertainment place, you know. So it, everybody's trying to make something different to more appealing for somebody instead of the same old thing. You know, it's like. It, when you're going the same direction every time, they want to do something different. So I think they put more road races in it to try and attract more people and to go to different venues and go there. You know, because obviously the the package that we're running this year and we've run for the last couple of years is, you know, they've they've made up the you know the low downforce, the high downforce, the 550 motor, the 750 motor, and they're looking at everything what, what people at. And I think it's it's a market. I think whatever TV and NASCAR decides to do, you know, that's what they're going to do. I mean, a lot of people may not like it, but if you want to participate, you're going to like it. But so, you know, with the new car coming out, it's going to have bugs. It's going to have flaws, but eventually it'll work because you're all going to have it. I, I like the road races. I, I get bored watching a race in Kansas City or Chicago, the same mile and a half track. So I like the road courses because it's a different course. And I love the well, and I love the super speedway races. Well, super speedway is a lot of action. A lot of things can happen when you look at it. Super speedway, it doesn't matter. Everybody's competitive. Yes, anybody can win. So when when you go to a, a mile and a half racetrack, the guy you look at restarts, everything gets competitive. After that, it's, you know it's like watching ants on a screen, you know. But to think if the tires wore out more. I believe you would have a lot better races. Like this year, when you looked at certain racetracks like Atlanta, you know, when we used to go to Fontana, those tracks would wear out. You have to handle. So, I mean, now you can put two tires on and still compete. You know, years ago when I raced, you couldn't put two tires on and compete. You had to put four tires on. Right. You know, so just maintain. It's just a different air. But I think the biggest thing is, is they want people on top of each other. For racing and and some of the races are really good but i mean when you look at kyle larson <clears throat> he's got that knack he just doesn't let the car ever bind up he never ever he may crack the throttle whatever but he's always going forward he never puts him if you're in front of him he's figuring out how to go around you it's no different when he in darlington you know he ricochets it off the fence to try and get on the outside of Danny, and it almost worked. You know, so. <laughs> I feel did, like there's a lot of that. It almost worked. Did you uh, did you ever race at Daytona? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Is it? Is it? I enjoyed it. I'm. I mean, I drove Kevin Harvick's truck there uh, years ago. I mean, we had it. We almost had it won. Almost, you know, I ended up fourth. But I mean, it was one of those deals where a bunch of Dodges jammed up on us. We had a late caution. At the end, that's what benched the field. If not, we would have checked out, and I, I would have. Uh, I know. I mean, not saying I had a great opportunity to win it. It's never over until that checker flag falls. There's a lot of races I've led coming off the last corner and broke, or something stupid's happened. So I, I never count your chickens for their hatch. That was my whole deal. I never would cheer until it was over. There's with. more first-time winners, it seems like, there than anywhere else because it's such a a lot of luck in that in the last couple of laps. Well, yeah, that's why. Plus, you're all competitive, so I mean, that's what it is. You can you can go in and you can have a bad pit stop, as long as you're still in the draft, you can still draft your way up. 
you can't go out now and have a bad pit stop because you know you may come in fourth and go back 25th it's going to be tough for you to drive back to the front you know but i mean it showed you how fast back to the guy you don't like the other night kyle when he had that speeding pit penalty on in richmond that he come down pit road and came back up and still finished in the top 10 well i'm not a fan of his but he's a hell of a racer so let's go, I want to clear that now. He's yeah. very, 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 very good. That's one reason I don't like him. He reminds me of the spoiled rich kid that everything in life goes good for him for. The guy, he's problem is that never, no, no, none of them are more rich where they come from. None me. of them are. Those guys have done it. Those guys have done it on their own. They made their their wealth, but they didn't come from wealth. Oh, I don't know. It just that's what he come off as. But he's a very talented driver. There is no doubt about that at all. Now. What well, cool. how so what's the hierarchy in the in the pit or not in the pit but in what you do so you're the spotter and you're talking directly to the driver are you at the top of of like where you are in relations to other people that are uh, also helping the driver well basically you mean where where do I rate with the driver or are you asking like where where am I positioned on the no, race no 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 like yeah like is there anybody else in the driver's ear or is it just you. Well, there's me and the crew okay. chief, the crew chief on the pit box. You know, I can tell the crew chief of what I'm seeing on the racetrack, you know, and whatever. I try and when the yellow flag comes out, I just say yellow and I try and get off the radio and let them communicate to themselves. We have a channel two that I can voice my opinion on channel two to him that the driver doesn't hear and other people in the pits do hear, you know. So you just try and work out the best scenario to get our stuff for farther forward if if people are starting to peel off and starting to pit, I can say, hey, they're starting to pit now. Think about your pit cycle, whatever, and however you want to work that through. So, so that, it, it's, a, it's a chess game. So y'all are going to Bristol this weekend, right? The best yes, track, the, the outside of the super speedway is my favorite one to watch. Now, this one's going to be on asphalt instead of dirt, correct? Thank you God. Like, you didn't like yes. the dirt then. Why would you have – this is just Rick talking. You have one of the best short track facilities around. Why would you slow it down and put it at a one-groove racetrack and just put dirt on top of it when you can run multiple grades and everybody looks for it and everybody can't wait to get there? And it's so many unknowns that you're starting race cars single file like you do on a local racetrack because the mud's flying up too much and nobody can see now, granted, it was cool when it was all done and over with, but if you look at it, go back and look at Bristol dirt and watch Bristol asphalt this weekend. I mean, I, concrete. It's going to be 180 degrees. You're, you're running 18, 19 seconds laps. Now you're running 14 second laps. So, I mean, makes no I would, sense to me. But that's I would take me. out one of them damn mile and a half tracks, and I would take that dirt series to Eldora and then let, or Knoxville and then let them run the uh, – Bristol both in on asphalt is what I would do. Wow. You got to realize the car, you know, you're looking at race cars that aren't made to race on dirt. Right. You know, so, so you're putting a bandaid on something that you think it needs to be. The trucks have went there and they've run them and, you know, and I think they've had great success at Eldor and they had good jobs at, at Knoxville this year, but it was still, I think, I think you're just going to tear up equipment. <laughs> That's what the fan That's, likes though. He, I understand, but it's not its not racing, in my opinion. It, it doesn't take talent to run into anybody. That's very, that's very true. I will give you that. <laughs> I mean, so if you're, running, if you're running third and you don't like the guy in front of him, just boot the guy in front of you to discard him to go underneath the both of them. To me, that's just, that's just not racing. So, I mean, it takes talent to, to maneuver now, and pass Del somebody. Se- Del so- Senior bumped a lot of guys. Yeah, he bumped him, but he he didn't he didn't shove him. He didn't dump him out of the way. He just moved him up so he could go on. Yeah, I mean you don't you're not knocking the damn fenders off and wrecking something. Could you imagine him racing today? We wouldn't have all these venues like we have. We wouldn't. I don't think so because you had certain people that had a certain voice, and you had certain people that got out and you know interacted with the officials and everybody they needed to do. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't be what it is, but I think it would have been a, a different process to get there. But all this other stuff, we wouldn't have it today. 
I don't think we'd be racing in rain. <laughs> no, 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 no. And he probably wasn't a big fan of uh, of uh, road courses either, was he? Well, he well, he won road courses. He won Sonoma. He's done a good job at all of them. So he was a well-rounded racer. I mean, he did everything. His speedways w- was his, you know, forte. But he he could win on anything. He's won on short track, big track, little tracks, and I mean, he didn't get the name Intimidator for nothing. But if you look at the races now versus the races then, it's just you know, it's a different deal. You know, it's where they're at. So how the hell? It's just how do you? It'll never be like. How it do was. you make it? As a, at the, how do you get to the very tip top? Because I mean, there there's so many people scrambling around at the bottom trying, and there's, you know, there, there's only a limited amount of cars each week. How does a guy come through the ranks? Well, I think the biggest thing is sometimes, you know, years ago when there was plentiful sponsors and before they multiple teams, you know, owners would have a slush fund or whatever to see a young kid to give them a try and see how they would make it or not make it. You know, right now it's so expensive to make things work. People don't have slush funds or you got to bring money to make it work. But I mean, when you look at the, you know, the big three, you know, when you look at Hendrix and you look at Gibbs, you look at Penske and you look at Stuart Haas and you, and you look at the, when they have multiple teams there, multiple cars, multiple people to draw from. And then you have different pit crews and stuff like that to get on pit road. So it just changes the whole avenues of, of how you do it. But to get into it, raw talent, somebody take a chance on you. It's no different what Chip Canassi did with Kyle Larson. And that's why he was very loyal to him and he didn't leave him. When he probably had multiple chances to leave him and go to other teams. But he figured, hey, he gave me a chance. I'm not leaving. So that's until his, you know, he had his problem on the computer. Right. Is it harder to make it now as a driver, that, or was it harder back uh, back in your heyday? I think it was equally hard all the way across, but, I mean, you still have to have that ability to go make it happen. And I think now you can probably get more in a position if, if you had a bunch of money to bring to somebody. Right. You could drive their stuff. So I'm not saying you're going to be better or you're not going to be that guy. You still have to have the ability for somebody to to back you to get you there. But, I mean, you know, there's a lot of guys that did a lot of things just to race years ago to make things happen. So everybody had a unique story of what we did, you know. You know, know, years ago I worked for a company, Reynolds Aluminum, and I always – I built my own late models and all the other stuff. And I go – I found out they had a dismemberment, you know, of of $5,000. So I was – had my finger in the shear. I was going to cut it off so I could buy a Ed Hell race car. And I figured if I cut my pinky, I won't need it. <laughs> and I was going to go, I mean, it was going to make me the racer, you know? Thank goodness I got sense in my head. But anyway. <laughs> that, you're going to cut your pinky off. Oh, I figured, you know, I mean, what are you going to do with your pinky? You know, I figured, how can I get to my next level? I know I'm this good, but I need a better car. Holy cow. I didn't have, I didn't have X number of dollars to go get it. It was close. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that's what I'm telling you. How bad do you uh, want it? That's that's what I tell people. How bad do you want it? What are you willing to give up to do it? That, that's fascinating. Mm. Do you watch F1 racing ever? I do periodically. Yes, I I watch the show Speed or whatever it is on Netflix has a series every year, and and, I, and I've watched it the last three seasons of it, and I've enjoyed it, but. It seems to me a fan for F1 racing, it, it's that there's two guys going to win every week almost, and it's. Well, I mean, you look at the biggest budgets, and you look at the biggest and the people that buy the best drivers. I mean, when you look at the drivers, and they have drivers that set those cars up and drive them, but but when the guys come in the F1, they magically pick up a couple tenths. So that's where you're talking about where that level of disparity, and that's where you look at. Mercedes and a lot of people, McLaren and all these guys catching up. It's just a matter of the right engineers, the right people, and everything doing the right thing. Now, my one of my last questions is: You're in the car for three hours. You're sweating, so obviously, you know you've taken in fluid to not get dehydrated. What do you do if you gotta go to the bathroom? I don't know. I've never pissed never? myself. Poppy, never ever did. I always would. Go to the, I would always go before I started. It's like when you get excited about something. You actually go up there and, you know, right when you get ready to get in a race car, like, damn, I got to have that last little squirt. <laughs> but I never, ever, I, my mind was on racing 
it was never on what I had to, if I had to pee or something or whatever. You know, there is certain people that, you know, have probably shook themselves up or beat themselves up in their kidneys and they, they actually have to go, you know, but I never have, you know, and I've heard of people that say they have, you know, so I couldn't, I just couldn't imagine. So, but that's just me <laughs> sitting in your, but I figured, you know, as much as you put in, as much as you're going to sweat out, you should be able to sweat, you know, you wouldn't have to pee to be honest with right. you, but what's going to be hot as hell in them cars. That's, it's hot. It's a lot hotter than a lot of people ever think about. I mean, think about when you're outside here, you know, you get inside those race cars with, you know, 2000 exhaust temperature and all the gears and everything else, no window sealed, no air moving around. You know, you got an air conditioner on, you know, that blows on your head. You have a cool suit, but no matter how you look at it, you're sitting on friggin' exhaust heat. You know, it's, it's 130, 140 degrees in there. And you never, I never ever realized it until there was a caution. That's when. And then I realized how hot it was. But when I was racing, I never realized Be it was hot. I never thought of it. Because your mind was always somewhere else in the middle of the race. Yeah, it was just, it's just like if you're flying an airplane, you're only thinking about flying an airplane. If you're thinking about driving a race car, it was a relaxing thing for me because I only thought about it. If I thought about what I was going to do when I was done with this, you're totally not engaged in what you're doing. Right. So you have to be locked in, focused on what you're doing. You're not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to do this. So that, that was... To me, as everybody used to ask us, like, I was more relaxed there because I only thought about one thing, inflicting pain and trying to win or do the best I could, you know, unless we had obstacles we had to, you know, counter from. Then you looked at, okay, uh, what, how can I achieve the best finish I can today with, say, I got a, you know, motor or exhaust leak or I got a fender knocked in or whatever. What's the best avenue to right. fix it? Now, how many moves would you think ahead when you were a driver? Do you do you think just one move ahead and let's execute that? No, you, when you you look, your eyes don't lie. So you always you always follow your eyes. You don't think. You don't put a thought into it. You just it. do. You put a reaction. You just to do it. it. You right. do it. You just do it. Sometimes you do it great. Sometimes you whoa, <laughs> shit. you know. But, you know, everything can change, but it's no different down looking down the road. You're looking down the road. You know, you don't sit, you know, and think about what you're going to do or how you're going to do it. You know, there might be obstacles of somebody pulling out or somebody whatever, but you're watching. You know, you're not distracted. It's no different, you know, shooting sporting clay. Right. Your eyes see what you shoot, you know, and if you're going to sit there and think, next thing you know, it's gone. Yeah. You miss. Now, when did you get into the sporting clays? Is that something you've always done? I started I started years ago. You know, I drove for Marshall Chesron and he used he owned car dealerships and he used to have a you know, shoot, you know, everybody put together and they do their deal and I done it for I don't know, probably early nineties till late nineties. Then I never got back into it heck, probably to about five, six, seven years ago. And now it's just now that I'm you know, I race on the weekends and it's something to do by yourself. You meet a few buddies at the range and then, you know, you, you try and be competitive and you try and do the best you can. So I got into it here lately. And I, I mean, I'm all, I mean, I'm all in, you know, and unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you know, you probably, you know, first you shoot your one gun, then you think you got to have a better gun. And then, you know, obviously you just got to fix yourself to do now, better. Can, I don't, I don't envision you as doing this for fun. Uh, like I, pretty competitive, I'm competitive, very competitive with right, myself. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't envision you going out to the range and just like, Oh, you know, we'll see what happens today. Like I, I very no, calculated. That's not how I, I try. I try and do every time I practice or every time I shoot, I figure out why Mr. How, why I hit him or how I could do better. That's important too. Cause so, I think why you hit it. I don't think a lot of people think of that. Why did I, why did, why did this work? I think a lot of people only right. look at their failures and try to take a lesson out of that. They don't look at their successes and think, well, what the, how the fuck did that work? Yeah, you're right. There's a hope and a prayer when certain <clears throat> shit happens, right. you know, but but you got to figure out, you know, obviously where you're pointed, the way the gun is. Did I lick my head? Did I rock my eyes? Did I do this? Did I stay engaged? Did I give it, 
you know, everybody says it's magical. Well, how far did you lead it? I, 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 I have no freaking clue. I'm just looking where it's going. You know, my eyes are leading and the barrel's moving to it. I don't, I don't know, you know, 259 Cadillacs. I don't know. I just shoot. The <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we've kept you an hour, sir. It has been a lot of fun talking to you. Well, I appreciate this. It, it was fun. It was Good a lot time. of fun. Um, if you ever get out to Texas and you want to shoot some birds, you look us up and we'll, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you. I would love to do that. I'd love to. Hey, you guys ever done the hog? We, do that, we do that. Yes. Yeah. I've watched those guys out of helicopters when they well, do that. We can that hook deal. you up with one of them if you want to. <laughs> so what kind of bird do you do? Uh, quail? We do waterfowl, ducks, ducks and, and geese. geese. Right now we're in the middle of dove season. Ducks. Wow. What gun uh, do you shoot? I've got a uh, 12 gauge Browning Maxis two. They just came out last year. I Set shoot over. Uh, I shoot Satori over unders. You shoot yep. a Satori. Yeah, I got me a, I got me a Beretta A400. I got me a, a Browning Maxis, the old uh-huh. humpback gun. Uh-huh. And I just bought me a, I just bought me that Renegade, what? that Savage gun. That's probably one of the smoothest shooting guns there is, but. My clay gun is a Kriegoff. I shoot a Kriegoff over and under. Jeff's an over and under guy. How do you like your uh, your humpback? How do you like the A5? I like yeah. it actually. You know, it when you when you think about, well, obviously we all shoot. You got one vision in front of you. You look at the little humpback. You're always lined up where you're at, and you need to do it. You know, I, I have some of the older ones, the older Magnum ones, and then I got the brand new one that they just came out with a couple years ago, but. The smoothest shooting gun I got, which is real heavy though, is that Savage Renegade. That that is a very nice gun. It's got Monte Carlo stock where you can plug them on and off, and your length of pull to plug in and out. Right. But it's heavy to carry through. Yeah. The piece. But if you're wallowfowl shooting, no, it'd right. be simple. Because I just like I said, I just got the Maxis too, but I think my next gun is going to be the A5. There's something about it. It's cool looking. There's not another gun out there that looks like it. It's just it's. Well, I mean, you think about John Browning made that right. gun years ago when he went he went to Re- uh, Remington to make it. Then he had to go to FN to make it overseas. Matter of fact, I found I was down at a, a gun shop and a guy walked in and he had two A5 16 gauge with poly chokes and they were old. And I looked at him and I go and and he didn't want nothing for them. I mean, I think he I think I bought them for a hundred a hundred oh, quarter Jesus. piece. So one was like one was 1902, and the other one was 1922. I took him to a gentleman out here that refurbished them for me yeah. completely. Perfect guns. They were they were obviously a two and a half inch shell. Somebody went in with a, a gunsmith and made them two and three quarters. But he says you got two beautiful guns. Then I found another one. It was a 1940 something. I redone it was another A5, but it's a 12 gauge. And then I got a. Then I have a a Magnum. A5 with a 30 inch barrel. It's a full shell. So they used to make them for two and a half inch shells? I did not know that. Well, that's way mm-hmm. early ones. That's all they have. Two and a half inches. Way early. Wow. I did not yeah. know that. What do you guys shoot for? What do you shoot for uh, ammo? You two shoot and three quarter uh, bismuth. We have a sponsor, Boss Shot Shells, and they make bismuth. And for what we do, um, right. that they're, they're the. How do you choke them? How do you choke for I water? Use, so with bismuth, I use a full choke. Okay, and then some people with steel they use yes, a modified. Yes, improved choke? or modified. Yeah, but and then what do you shoot velocity? Uh, let me see. I just I got one. I got a box right here. If it says uh, yeah, I think thirteen fifty. So bismuth is a little bit slower than steel. Yeah, but it's got more correct. Knockdown. Yeah, because it carry. It's got. Uh, it don't it's go denser. It don't go through. Right, it's a denser, so it it, it carries its velocity more. But, uh, yeah, I, I shoot gotcha. bismuth, and I shoot a full choke. And uh, contrary, you know, I'm not a very good shot, well, though. I need to get out there and. What length barrel? What length barrel you shoot? 28 uh, is mine. 28-inch 28 28. barrel. But I, I need to do that. I, I, I've never – I always bird hunt, but I've never waterfowl hunt. It's never, a great never, hobby. Never. It's addicting, though. And, listen, talking to you for the last hour, it might be dangerous for you to get off into this because – I, I mean, I got all the guns to do it. All, all I got the time to get there now. <laughs> yeah, like it, it it gets in your blood. I'm take you guys up on that. Though. I like to do it. I'm getting ready to go uh, pheasant hunting in Iowa here in right after Thanksgiving. Oh, that'll be great. Do you go every year? 
I tried to do it. I take me and my kids go. We've done it. This will be, we went to uh, St. John's, Kansas about five years ago. Then we switched off and went to uh, Cherokee, Iowa. Got a guy out there that has uh, some property. And we go out there and stay for about five oh, days. Nice. Have some fun. Go shoot those wild birds because they're a little different than the yeah. pen birds. Yeah. The pen birds, they, they, they ain't got no spunk to live. The other ones, they're surviving every time. And y'all go, do y'all try to go around Thanksgiving every year? Thanksgiving, it all depends on how his harvest is, either Thanksgiving to uh, first okay. December, whatever. But I, Bronco fans, so me and Jones are going to go to the Detroit game in uh, Denver, 12th of December. So i got to plan my stuff oh, here. Boy, they, they got hit with the injury bug. Jerry Judy's out, what, eight weeks? Yes. High ankle sprain. Yeah, it could have been a lot, that been was a lot a worse. nasty, nasty hit. It was I ugly. thought he broke his ankle. Is I thought I thought it was broken. That's exactly what we all yeah, thought. Yeah, I thought it season ended. But so who's your Super Bowl picks? Who's your Super Bowl picks? I, I think Buffalo is going to go and probably back to uh, Brady. It's hard to say. Tampa Bay and the Tampa Bay. I got the Rams this year over Buffalo. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I'm a big Matthew Stafford fan. He is like – Old school quarterback, make things happen. And watched him the other night. He was awesome. You know, and in Detroit, I was hoping he was going to go to Denver, to be honest with you, but it didn't so work So, I'm out. a Packer fan. You think uh, you think your Broncos pull off a big trade at the end of the year for Rodgers? Or after last week, you might not want him anymore. Well, I mean, I think Rod. I mean, the guy can do it. He just don't want to do it that, that's right exactly now. That's exactly right. You know, you know he's, he was – he bickered the whole time to get gone. You know, they wouldn't let him go. And I think it would have happened. But, I mean, what Denver – what they wanted from Denver was like six players of all different magnitudes. Made no sense, you know. You know, and Teddy Bredwater, he, he manages yeah. the game. You know, Drew Lowe probably throws the ball better. But when Peyton was there and they won, they managed the game. Great defense and managed the game. And Teddy managed the game this week and did a great job. But he was a great job when – when they played when he played for the Saints, but don't count the Saints out either with James. No, West. they got a good defense too. Yeah. Defense wins championships. Tampa Bay won last year because of the defense, not because of Tom Brady. You're exactly right. And that's how you're exactly right. That's, that's what Fangio did. I mean, our, our secondary in Denver is pretty stout yeah. right now. Yeah. The re- and I, I just wish that Vaughn and Chubbs could play together, but Chubbs got an ankle problem right now that game so. last night was a magical game what a football game is that incredible wow, I'm or telling what? You, win you lose know, win lose and then win i'm not a raiders fan because of denver's division i've always been it but that was pretty damn entertaining yeah, Derek game. Carr played a hell of a game i was glad to see them win but that's what's so crazy about him he can play so awesome yeah. but then all of a sudden don't even look like he's i think he's there. like the dallas cowboys he plays to the level of his opponent of uh, the competition yes. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, like last with the Cowboys on Thursday night against mm-hmm. Tampa Bay, that was a hell yeah. of a game too. And if the kicker would, if the kicker would have freaking kicked things, it would never even been mm-hmm. in the position. If he'd have made field goals, and he's a great kicker with back problems, or he had, you think he had surgery yeah, on his back. So the Cowboys will play just as tight a game against San Diego next weekend, Los and if Angeles. they play or, or or Los Angeles, the Chargers, and then in whenever they play, if they played the Houston Texans, they play at the level of them. That's the way the Cowboys do. And it's crazy. Yes, and my biggest thing is, is we and we argue on one of our big Facebook posts is about Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson is not a big time quarterback. He is a running back who can throw the ball a little bit. And last night he had a chance to go win a football game and he didn't do it. Yeah. Can you believe that guy's footwork? Oh, oh he's amazing. He's Michael Vick, fast. It, yeah, but I mean, he is lightning yep. fast. He steps forward. And steps back faster yep. than anybody can freaking even move. I saw a highlight today, and, I mean, there's three or four defenders around him, and he was just in and out, and yeah. then he broke the pocket well, and delivered a strike. I mean, he's got – Dude, I watched him at one time. He juked that dude so bad, he just fell on the ground and went right by him. It was like, holy can, cow. Can you imagine throw. when we get a guy like that that can run like that, but he can throw like Russell Wilson? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. That'd be incredible. But that's not Lamar Jackson. Well, hey, we appreciate you being on here, Rick. We wish you the best, and if you ever get to West Texas, let us know. What part of West Texas? Two hours east of Lubbock. 
two hours east. Yep. An okay. hour north of Abilene, an hour southwest of Wichita Falls. Right in the middle of nowhere. Three hour, we're three hour, two and a half hours west of uh, Dallas Fort Worth. So right. right out in the middle of nowhere, which makes it <laughs> great for bird hunting. You guys been getting wa- no. any weather? Did you get all hot those and dry? Stuff? We need rain now. We had a wet, wet summer, but we have gotten really wet or dry the last six weeks. Bad dry. Yeah, we're we're I needing a rain, something fierce. But we, well, I'm sure. Oh it'll yeah, come. it always it always evens out in the wash. So we appreciate you coming on here, sir, and you enjoy uh, the rest right, of your man. day and good luck this weekend. All right, thank Bye-bye. you very much. See you guys. You. Very interesting guy. <clears throat> he, uh, interesting life. Man does not do anything for fun. No, I saw that wreck he had too, and it's a lot like Dale Junior's wreck or Dale Senior's wreck. It doesn't look as bad doesn't as a lot of wrecks bad. you see, but it just that right angle and yeah, that right that just bad deal, just a bad break. And he's a very lucky man, um, enjoyable guy. Yes, he is around some interesting people. All right, well, we appreciate everybody listening to us. Get over to Split Rate and check out Cletus and Ollie. Uh, you got anything to plug about yourself? I don't. No, I really don't. You don't have to self plug yourself. I don't have anything to self promote. Nobody's. Nobody's reaching out to me for anything, Jeff. You had a decent teal hunt this morning. Decent teal hunt today. Had a, you've had four last four days we've teal hunted, and you've had de- decent to good hunts every day. Dove season is absolutely abysmal in Texas right now. Gosh almighty, we need some weather bad. I think that weather's going to come. I'm hoping next Wednesday, they're saying. Yeah, but anyway, I mean. God dang fly. Anyways, we appreciate Wednesday. y'all for listening to this. Thank y'all. God bless y'all. Have a great week. Go check out Shin Gear Waders. They have inventory in stock, and you need waders that aren't going to leak. And if they do will leak, you just send them back, and they come right back to you. But they do have waders in stock, so go check them out. Go check out Pacific Calls, Dive Bomb Industries, Eyesight Drone Service, Bangtail Whiskey, Stanfield Hunting Outfitters, Goose Creek Retrievers, Gun Dog Outdoors, uh, Looking Glass Duck Club, Lucky Duck, Dirty Duck Coffee, Boss Shot Shells, and Dive Bomb Industries.